We're so grateful to Joel for his willingness to spend uh, an evening with us every year. He's done so for the past five, six, seven years, and it is so awesome. We appreciate his doing that. Joel Skousen is the editor of the World Affairs Brief and um, easily our most popular speaker, and we uh, offer him a standing invitation every year, <laughs> okay, to come and be a part of our meeting every December. Uh, he's a political scientist by training, specializing in the philosophy of law and constitutional theory, and he's also a designer of high security residences and retreats. His latest book in this field is Strategic Relocation, North American Guide to Safe Places. Joel consults with people who need to relocate for security and increased self-sufficiency. He also helps people near large cities to develop contingency plans um, involving rural, farm, or recreational property. Joel was raised in Oregon and later served as a fighter pilot for the U.S. Marine Corps during the Vietnam era prior to beginning his design firm specializing in high security residences and retreats. For years, he has published a newsletter entitled The World Affairs Brief, a globally acclaimed exposition of the objectives and plans of the powers that be. The World Affairs Brief is readily available as a weekly email newsletter. Just visit worldaffairsbrief.com, right? worldaffairsbrief.com and sign up there. Please give a highland and a warm welcome to Mr. Joel Skousen. Thank you very much, Lowell. Lowell and I go back a long way in the freedom battle, and so it's always nice to be introduced by Lowell. I am also the nephew of W. Cleon Skousen, <clears throat> who many of you may know. He was a great patriot, and uh, yeah, I can remember as early as 17 years old where Cleon set me on the pattern reading his fine book, The Naked Communist, to the kinds of inside betrayal that was going on within our own government. And the only criticism that I learned later on when I was chairman of the Conservative National Committee in Washington, D.C. during the Reagan administration is that most of the people in the Roosevelt and Truman administration that were communists were not put there by communists. They were put there by globalists. And the globalists, like Alger Hiss, who did join the Communist Party, did so so that the communists wouldn't think twice about why he was helping them. It's the same thing that Henry Kissinger did in East Germany when he was a young man, went and joined the Communist Party. So that when he ended up betraying us in the betraying South Korea, or I mean South Vietnam at the Paris Peace Talks, and giving China a seat in the uh, Security Council and uh, betraying Taiwan, get it, kicking them out of the United Nations, the communists didn't think anything of it. Kissinger's one of us, but he isn't. He's a globalist. And what pe people are falling in for this grand deception, even today, there's too many people in the conservative movement that think that Joe Biden is a puppet of the Chinese Communist Party because he's accepted money through Hunter and other things. But it's not true. He's a pure puppet of the globalist. Now, the globalists don't care a whit if any of their leaders take money from the Communist Party because they like the communists to think that they control Joe Biden, but they don't. And so stop following the mantra that we've got a bunch of communists in our government. They are globalists. And they're using communism. Let's look at George Soros, one of the big top financiers in the globalist movement. Why is he financing communists and BLM and Antifa movements? Because the globalists use communism to break down the social order so that they can come in in the chaos that ensues and have their solution accepted. It's a lesser solution. It's a less radical solution than communism. That's been their mantra ever since they brought the communists to power in Russia, $20 million in gold bullion by Jacob Schiff that went into the communists, $20 million in gold bullion from the British Anglo-establishment uh, Anglo to the communists. That's why they betrayed Chiang Kai-shek and Red China. 
And Cleon does an excellent job in documenting that betrayal um, by the various powers that be within the Roosevelt and Truman administration. George Catlett Marshall was a globalist. And to a certain extent, so was Eisenhower. Now, Eisenhower is revered by all of you as a great Republican president. But he's guilty of some real war crimes. General Eisenhower is the one that mandated and issued the orders which required that all of the Eastern Europeans in Europe be forcibly repatriated to Russia. He also denied food and, and tents and coats and, uh, in the dead of winter to German prisoners and was responsible for killing, for killing 20,000 German prisoners of war. So, even though President Ezra Tapp Benson, who knew about conspiracy and communism, didn't see this, and he didn't see it at all because it was kept hidden for many, many years. But the greatest crime of George, uh, of, um, of George Catlett Marshall and, uh, uh, and Dwight D. Eisenhower was that they left 20 to 30,000 American and British soldiers who had been liberated in prison camps by the Russians, and the Russians kept them as hostages to make sure that uh, Eisenhower let all of the Europeans, or forced all of the Europeans to be repatriated to Russia, where they went immediately into gulags and slave labor camps. And then after the U.S. had complied with all of that, and a lot of people committed suicide so they didn't have to go back to Russia, and a lot of these people had never lived under communism in Russia. In fact, there was an entire army of white Russians who had fought and lost because the U.S. and Britain pulled the military support out of the right white Russian armies. <coughs> and the British betrayed them to Stalin. They came in with trucks and loaded up this entire army who fought for the Germans because they were trying to get rid of Soviet communism loaded them into trucks and told them they were taking them to rest and relaxation camps and then drove them into the Russian side of the border and betrayed them. Now, you never hear about these things because history is covered up. It's part of the conspiracy of, of, of the historians on the left. And, um, and a lot of this is because, you know, historians are kind of yes-men. They're yes-men to the education establishment. They know that if they take the position that it's either an anti-Soviet or um, in, in any way anti-Chinese, et cetera, they'd be blackballed from the education uh, establishment. So it's been very, very evil. Uh, there's other books that tell you the excruciating information about some of these betrayals, and I'll give you a couple of references. And it does you good to read these books, even though they're dated now, because these two books that I'm going to tell you about give you first-hand experiences from people who had dealings with the State Department, with the President of the United States, and with the people on the second floor of the, of the State Department that betrayed anti-communists within Cuba and Nicaragua. The Cuban story is best told by a book called Dagger in the Heart by Mario Lasso. Now, Mario Lasso was an English-speaking attorney um, dual citizen, U.S. Cuban, who worked for and did most of the legal work for the Batista government. And so he had access to all of the letters and threats and other things that cut off aid to Batista uh, and documented as well this massive propaganda campaign by the New York Times, Herbert Matthews in particular was a real evil uh, person, and this is beyond, you know, most of your times. Um, and then uh, it's just tragic to see. And one of the most interesting things that he covers in his book, he tells you the real story of the Cuban Missile Crisis and the aftermath of it. You know, in your history, you're told that we won the Cuban Missile Crisis. We got them to take the missiles out. But what they don't tell you and what Lasso does tell you is that we gave up all of our intermediate uh, ballistic missiles aimed at Russia in the country of Turkey in order to get a few puny Russian missiles out of Cuba, of which we were never allowed to inspect. 
So we really never know if they got taken out. But we also, and President Kennedy, Kennedy made the grave error of promising Khrushchev that he would never, ever destabilize or invade Cuba. So he gave Cuba a free hand to become a nest of subversion all throughout Latin America. So we didn't win the Cuban Missile Crisis. It was a real betrayal. And that leads us to Nicaragua, because Nicaragua was the first country that was the attack from the Cuban, uh, with Soviet arms and Cuban training, uh, to try to undermine Anastasio Somoza. General Somoza was the elected president of, uh, of Nicaragua. It was a very fine person. But you wouldn't know that from the New York Times and the Washington Post and the other mainstream media. They literally put lie after lie and crucified, uh, you know, this man. Uh, I, you know, the, the book is called Nicaragua Betrayed by Anastasio Somoza. Nicaragua Betrayed. It's worthy of having in your library. It's still available on Amazon as a used book. I just picked up an, uh, an additional copy myself. And even though I read it years ago, it's heart-wrenching because Somoza documented every letter, every communication with the State Department, with even Jimmy Carter, and with ambassadors and everyone, and documented every single betrayal. And it's just heart-rendering because it's blatant. It's blatant supporting communism. Now, but they weren't communists. Most of these people were globalists using communism to break down the social order in Nicaragua so that they could come back in and eventually, you know. And the same thing, when I got to the Conservative National Committee in Washington, D.C. in 1982, Nicaragua had already fallen, and I became an advisor down to Latin America in El Salvador, and El Salvador was then under the target of the Cubans. And they were going through the same thing. They asked me to come down there and set up a free market party called ARENA, a-R-E-N-A. -E it means sand in Spanish, but it is an acronym for a libertarian party. And so I was schooling them on how you set up a constitutional government because, you know, every Latin American country is semi-socialist. And all of a sudden, and they were short of money because, you know, the libertarian movement is very, very small in Latin America even though there's a Pedro Marroquin uh, University down there in Guatemala, which is just very, very libertarian and has had a lot of influence, doesn't have a lot of money. But it's interesting that the party got sabotaged because a wealthy investor came from the United States with a whole load of money offering it to the Arena party if they would allow him to have veto power over a lot of the policies. So they bought him off with money. And the Arena Party is one of the leading parties. It's mainstream Republican now, conservative Republican, which means it doesn't fight conspiracy. It doesn't fight for constitutional. In fact, one of the, um, one of the embassy officials, when I was at a meeting with um, the head of the Arena Party, he said, you can have any form of government you want, as long as it doesn't match the U.S. Constitution. Here's the endowment for democracy, paid for by U.S. taxpayer money, giving money as long as it's socialist in nature and no, no constitutional republic. I mean, Somoza was a constitutionalist. He was born in Nicaragua, but he went to high school at La Salle Military Academy in the United States and then graduated from the um, West Point so he was fluent in English, really imbued with the Constitution, and that's why he was chosen for destruction, because they wanted this arch-conservative, loyal to the U.S. Constitution, out of the way. In 1977, and I was just reading in chapter 6 of the book, he makes a very dramatic statement for a page and a half, and he said, in 1977, suddenly there became a press campaign, not only in the United States, in every major city, but in every international city, London, Berlin, Paris, etc., attacking me and telling the most outrageous lies. And he said, I had never realized that the left had so much power over the media that they could coordinate that kind of an attack and not publish my response so that the American people were, were denied getting the truth in the issue. 
Well, that was in 1977. When's the last time you saw something like that? Donald Trump, right? It wasn't a single day or hour of the year when all the mainstream media would attack Donald Trump. And it wasn't just the Washington Post and New York Times or the international press, etc. It was every local news station, even KSL, the worst propagandist in Utah for the left. I want to find out someday who's writing the script there. And I know they take a lot of material from the AP feed, which means that you get this leftist material, but they got to have somebody in there who agrees with all that. And so KSL used to be a fairly conservative station in, until um, uh, Hinckley was in charge of Bonneville Communications, and then he brought in credentialed individuals, which means you're on the left, to run Bonneville International, KSL, and all the other media, uh, you know, because, and that leads me to something I will cover in the private briefing after my presentation about um, where the church has gone uh, in, in this area. But what I want to say about conspiracy is that we are facing the most devastating series of propaganda that has ever hit the American public or the world for that matter. As I've told, and I think even last year I mentioned, there are three major worldwide conspiracies that we've had to de deal with. Number one, and this is, means that everyone across the world has accepted these as fact because no one has tried to debunk it. Number one was the phony fall of the Soviet Union. Everybody talks about the fall of the Soviet Union. It never fell. The Communist Party just went underground. They gave orders to the student unions to go forward with the protests. They told the KGB to stay home. They told the Stasi in East Germany, in Leipzig, to stay home and not arrest the students. In fact, I watched a documentary of Russians, libertarians, who were talking about the fall of the Soviet Union and Yeltsin and all this, and he said, you know, the thing we could never understand that we were celebrating in the street with Yeltsin, which they didn't realize he was a puppet as well, they said, where was the KGB? We never went anywhere without being followed by the KGB, and suddenly they had nowhere to be found. That's because this was a phony fall. And are we also to believe that the KGB could not capture Mikhail Gorbachev in his undefended villa? The KGB has undermined dozens of nations, and we're to believe that they couldn't capture Gorbachev in a failed coup? It's just incredible. And the worst thing of all is that when the media announced with a straight face, without challenging it, that the heads of the KGB, the GRU, the Defense Department, and several other heavy you know, were fleeing for their lives because of the failed coup. And no journalist at all ever asked, who were they fleeing from? Who does the KGB head flee from? Who does the head of the GRU, the Russian intelligence, flee from if he's the head of the GRU? Who does the defense chief head flee from? You see what I mean? It doesn't make sense. But not a single journalist in the United States questioned that. You don't think that they saw that contradiction? Of course they did. But they knew you never talk about those contradictions. The U.S. supported the phony coup because they wanted an excuse to bail out Russia. And they did so with <coughs> aid and trade. U.S. oil industries came in after the phony fall, rebuilt the entire Soviet oil system, allowing them to become one of the biggest producers of oil in the world. We also shipped palletfuls of $100 bills over to Russia, and that's why the oligarchs, who are the actual real communist leaders, the oligarchs, only had $100 bills when they went to Europe. They gave $100 bills for tips because they didn't have fives, tens, or twenties. They were dealing with palletfuls, suitcases full of $100 bills that the Federal Reserve has shipped to them. The second major worldwide conspiracy is the phony war on terror, 9-11. 9-11 was not, I repeat, not 19 independent hijackers attacking the World Trade Center. It was a deep state operation from beginning to end. They hired the, the terrorists, and they weren't, by the way, the 19 named terrorists. In fact, seven of those are still alive, so they didn't die in 
But the terrorists could not have loaded all the explosives in buildings one and two and seven that came down with controlled demolition. So there's a massive cover-up and conspiracy. Why would the government engage in a massive cover-up if this was a legitimate terrorist attack? What are they trying to hide? It's because it wasn't a legitimate terrorist. That was a false conspiracy. In fact, I had a humorous <laughs> conversation with uh, a mainstream friend of mine, and he said, and I challenged him about not believing in conspiracy with a subscriber to my brief, and he knew about my, my brief, and he said, oh, I believe in conspiracy. I believe there was 19 hijackers that, you know, took down the World Trade Center. I said, no, no, that's not a conspiracy. That's a false conspiracy. That's the official narrative to cover for the real conspiracy, which is the government itself, the deep state, loading the buildings with explosives. It took months of preparation. In fact, the weekend before 9-11 came down, someone went into the World Trade Center, both towers, and sealed them off. Sealed them off so that nobody could go in or out and turned off all the lights. First time it's ever happened. And that's when they set all the demolition charges. And I only found that out when I was on the Art Bell show and uh, coast to coast. And he was challenging me about this being a deep state operation. So somebody called in from New York who had been driving. He lives in Staten Island. He drives across into Manhattan every night. And sure enough, he said, look, I drove through there that night on the weekend, and those towers were dark. So he confirmed what I said. Art was impressed. But in any case, the third is the worst, and that is this. So what I want to tell you is, this is a worldwide conspiracy that is different from the other two. The other two just required that you accept what they say. But this one requires that you participate. And 80% of Americans are gullible enough to participate and go along with this. And that's the saddest thing that I come here to do, is that they have determined that they can, in fact, fool 80% of the people into not even questioning. The key to survival is going to be getting healthy. Now, as I look over this audience, I know you're all good conservatives, but about half of you are overweight and probably haven't exercised in 15, 20 years. And you know, I have spoken for the past seven years at this Highland Group, and in every single talk I have talked about, listening to the still, small voice of conscience. And what's so important about conscience is that it is where the real test of this life is happening. It's where you get all the little personal promptings from the Lord about what you should do, what not to buy, what not to purchase in terms of junk food, when to get up on time, when to exercise, and you've been, generally speaking, resistant to those your whole life. Or at least if you weren't resistant and you're up until 30, you began putting on weight, you got little promptings, you should lose weight, and you just disregarded them. Now what you don't realize is that you get penalized. You get penalized by the Lord by saying goodbye to the little temporal promptings. You keep waiting for big spiritual problems, higher light and knowledge, etc. But you're not going to get it because you're saying, get lost to the little temporal promptings. That's where the real test of life is taking. And when I come to speak next year, I'd like to see a different audience. <laughs> now, this is not comfort talk. This, is, this makes you uncomfortable, I understand. But I want you to understand that just knowing conservative principles and being allied with the U.S. Constitution isn't going to save you. Knowing truth, whether it's about the gospel of Jesus Christ or Constitution or conservative, isn't going to save you. Only listening to the promptings of conscience will. I'm here to tell you that the horrendous 
problem that's going to come in World War III, and this COVID thing is going to keep you occupied and dodging things until it comes, and it's going to blindside you. You're not going to see it coming. But it's going to be horrendous. It's going to start with a nuclear preemptive strike against U.S. military bases and missile forces because of PDD-60. Presidential Decision Directive 60, which was signed in 1997 by President Bill Clinton, completely revamped our nuclear posture from the Reagan Doctrine, which was to launch on warning and prepare to win a nuclear war, to absorbing a nuclear first strike, and then retaliate afterwards. And General Butch Neal of the Marine Corps said, retaliate with what? If you absorb a nuclear first strike, all of our military bases are gone, all our missile bases are gone. And Bill Clinton in that same year, 1997, made a promise to the Russians to keep 50% of our ballistic missile submarines in port at any one time. There's two ports, Kings Bay, Georgia, and Bangor, Washington, in the Seattle area. So that they could be more easily targeted as a gesture of goodwill that we aren't a threat to Russia. Just suicidal. Now, PDD-60 is still in force. Two weeks ago in the World Affairs Brief, I talked to several disarmament uh, lobbyists, like Arms Control Today, which to this day on their website, February, not Feb uh, November 1997, you can still read about PDD-60. And so I called up <coughs> Arms Control Today, or I emailed, and I said, do you have any information? Because I was responding actually to an article by Bruce Barnes of um, um, uh, a disarmament guy who helped, you know, write PDD-60, and he was talking about the need to do further disarmament and stop the U.S. from launching on warning. And I said, well, wait a minute, it already is stopped through PDD-60, and yet here's a guy in arms control today. 1997 has been a long way away. He apparently had no clue that it was still in force. So I called him up and I said, you know, are you aware of any nuclear doctrine that has replaced PDD-60, the one that dictates that our missile forces shall absorb a nuclear first strike? And he said he was not, but sent me over to the Federation of uh, American Scientists, a far-left anti-nuclear organization, and, uh, and I asked him, and he never responded. But it's interesting, they're all talking about Biden doing a new nuclear power, struck, uh, uh, nuclear power deal and revising things, and that's why I wanted to know if they knew that PDD-60. But here's what I think happened. No, they have purposely let everyone forget about PDD-60. They have not briefed our military generals at all about uh, uh, PDD-60. General Mike Flynn, who's a conservative, said, oh, there's not going to be any nuclear war. All the briefings that we receive indicate that it would result in mutual assured destruction. Mad. No, that's not true. You see, that proves that he was never told that PD-60 is going to require that our missile forces absorb the nuclear first strike. And then there's no way hardly to retaliate afterwards. So this is a very serious situation, but it's going to, this war is going to be preceded by <coughs> an EMP strike. <coughs> <clears throat> Only Russia and China have the ability to throw an EMP strike because it takes at least two or three super EMP weapons, and it takes about eight or nine regular EMP weapons. These are exploded at high altitudes so that it gives out a radiation, uh, electromagnetic radiation that hits the power lines, and it sends a huge thousand-volt surge down the power lines, hits your panel, and then fries everything connected to the, to the Internet, fries it all. And it's most dangerous when you have long power cords and, uh, and long, uh, because they act as an antenna. Uh, it's still, the jury is out on how much cars will be damaged. Uh, the government tests show that in a 300 mile circle directly under each explosion is where the maximum radiation is that may disable cars. Outside of that, your cars may shut down but will restart, hopefully. But in any case, it's not enough for you to listen to what I'm saying and say, gee, that's going to be horrible. I need you to picture how horrible that it's going to be. I need you to picture why you've really got to be in shape, because without any electricity, there'll be massive pillaging 
and refugee flows in, out of every major city because the food will be gone within three days. And if you're living in the major, even in Utah, you may think that Mormons are prepared, but they're not very prepared. Most Mormons have no more storage than probably three months in their pantry. Some Mormons have a full year's supply. But unfortunately, they've shared that information with a lot of their neighbors, and they're going to be beset with neighbors asking to share. And I'll tell you, if you start sharing, once there's full famine, you'll all be starving within a week. There's no way to share with thousands of people in your neighborhood and come out with anything left. And so that is why you need to do several things to prepare against this war. Now, the war will not take down major cities with nuclear explosions, except places like Hill Air Force Base and the Ogden area. Probably an air burst over Hill. And the region Hill's a primary target is because that's where they've got the guidance systems of the MX missiles. They're stored at Hill. And the missile bodies are out on the West Desert. They'll be hit as well. So if the wind's blowing from the northwest, you're going to get a massive amount of fallout down into Salt Lake, and it'll even reach, uh, you know, into Utah County. If the wind's from the south, as it is often here, it'll go further north, uh, et cetera. But you can't count on it. You need to have some kind of fallout shelter. It's very important. Now, if you're within a 10-mile radius of Hill Air Force Base, you would need blast protection. But that's really silly. It costs three times as much to have blast protection in an underground shelter than it does to have fallout protection. And so it's important that you simply move and relocate if you're within that area of Hill Air Force Base. That's the cheapest way to do it. And most people don't understand the threat, so you can sell your house, okay. But the other important thing is that there'll be famine for at least a year because the United States does not stockpile any of the transformers that, that uh, transform the high uh, thousands of volts of electricity in the intercontinental transmission lines down to usable energy. We don't stockpile. They're made in China. We maybe have two or three in the entire nation out of hundreds that are necessary. So don't count on the electricity coming back very often. You need to have ability to produce your own electricity. You need to have a fallout shelter in case fallout comes, because even if it comes, the wind's blowing the other way from Hill Air Force Base, if it's a south wind, you're going to get it from San Diego or Nellis Air Force Base or Area 51 in Las Vegas. So you, everyone needs to have a fallout shelter. That's very, very important. Uh, and additionally, as you know, there has become a great deal of animosity between people over this COVID thing. You've probably experienced in church people getting hostile to you if, you, if you're not willing to wear a mask, which I have never been willing to, and thinking that you're not faithful, you know, if you're not following, you know, the guidance. And this is just really unfair because this is not a revelation from the Lord. This is the brethren curring up to government, who they call wise and thoughtful health officials in government, and they're anything but wise. These people are maybe may unwitting conspirators, but eventually when you get up to the CDC level, it becomes knowing conspirators in the FDA and the WHO. But there is so much yesmanship in the medical establishment about following the protocols. And they are threatened with their license. Both the doctors, AMA, and the, and the nurses, National Nurses Association, have now threatened doctors and nurses with losing their license if they put out any information that's called disinformation, meaning anything negative about vaccines, and you lose your license. So that's terrible. Now, so I wanted to cover with you the freedoms that we lost because of this COVID thing. One of my pet peeves, as I talked about last week in the World Affairs Brief on is there anything left to be thankful for, my pet peeve is Mormons who pray in church at the 4th of July, thanking the Lord for all the freedoms that we enjoy in this country. It's time to wake up, people. We need to thank the Lord for the few remaining freedoms that we have left. So that people get the message. You don't have to preach to them. They get the message. Ooh, you mean we've lost some? Of course you have. 
You don't have the freedom to go to church if they have COVID restrictions. You don't have a freedom to open a business. If you're unvaccinated, you can't, in many places of the world, you can't go to restaurants or gyms or anyone else. Um, we've just lost a tremendous amount of freedoms. We no longer have the freedom from censorship. It's just rampant. It is done in the name of private corporations so that the government can't be accused of censoring. It would be illegal for the governor, government to censor, but because they let private corporations do it, they can get away with it. That's never going to end, people. Don't expect any of that to change. So when you try to convert people or get them to understand the seriousness <coughs> of our situation, it's very difficult for them to find the information on the Internet. It gets worse every day. I'm on the Internet all day long, and I do searches, etc. and it's amazing how hard it is to find things. And it used to be you'd have to go down 10 or 12 pages in a search to get it. It's not there anymore. It's just more and more mainstream the further you go down. It's just really getting irritated. <clears throat> so, let me cover some of the things that you need to do to prepare. <clears throat> the most important thing, as I said, is to Start to listen to your conscience and get in shape. Start to exercise. Not enough to just lose weight. You've got to be tough. You may have to, to, to flee someday to the New Jerusalem, the only place on the face of the earth that, the, that will not be at war, one, where people will not be at war one with another. That's the Doctrine and Covenants, section 45. So that's not going to be a picnic. You're not going to drive there in your SUV. Now, I've written several books about these things, and I want to cover some of those now. The most two most important books are one, The Secure Home, and that's 700 pages about everything you need to know about solar generators, fallout shelters, uh, designing an addition to your home, etc. And my son and I, my son is an engineer, and we're backlogged several months of design work, so we're having to send most people who want design work to the secure home. But the most, the cheapest way for people in Utah to do a shelter is this book, which is the High Security Shelter book, which is how to do a shelter in an existing basement. This is done, you know, probably for less than ten or fifteen thousand dollars, whereas a full-blown new construction in today's prices, using the secure home stuff, would be probably double or triple, triple that. I have some books outside. My son is out there, and this is normally $25 on sale for $15, and this one is normally $45, and now that's available for $30 just for you here. And this is 10 packs for survival, a list of 10 survival lists from everything from food, ammunition, and other things that you can help check against your stockpiles, and that's only $2. And this is strategic relocation, which most of you shouldn't need here in Utah because Utah is a pretty safe state. But in case you need it for your children who are living outside the, the state and things, this is normally $35, but available for $20. $20. So what I want to conclude with, ladies and gentlemen, is that we're facing a horrendous future. The war is getting closer every year. China's probably going to attack Taiwan after the Olympics, just like Hitler did World War II after the 1936 Olympics. Now, it's important to realize that it's not going to be pretty. It's going to be horrendous for a year, and there's going to be starvation. And too many of you are comfortable with the fact that you attend my lecture every year and you walk away saying, wow, that was really good to know. But I'm really disappointed that most people have not taken up any action. Now, I realize it's not easy. There is some expense involved. But a lot of you have new cars and other things, and you need to think about sacrificing some of the things you do in order to be able to afford building a shelter or moving or relocating to a safer area. Knowledge won't save your life unless you put it into action. And so that's important. Now, 
Let me ask a question here, if you can raise your hands. How many subscribe currently to my World Affairs Brief? Wow, that's pretty good. I would say that's about 20%. And I'm honored that you'll come and listen to me speak. But let me tell you, there's a little problem within Mormon society. We'll almost do anything to keep from paying for anything. You know, at a garage sale, it doesn't matter if the item's $10 or $3, we feel like, oh, I've got to Jew them down. I've got to get a better price. You know, I had a real nervous feeling in my conscience one day when I was doing a garage sale, and I was chastised by the Lord by saying, you know, you really shouldn't do that. In fact, if it's underpriced, you ought to give them a little more. And I started doing that, and boy, talk about good relations. They were just impressed that I would give you. So, the World Affairs Brief comes out every Friday. It costs $48 a year, about a dollar a week. Isn't very much. But people, you know, vigorously tune in to my K-Talk radio interview, 8 o'clock in the morning on Fridays, to get the World Affairs Brief without paying for it. Now, I don't necessarily need the, need the money. The Lord has blessed me financially. But you need to get the brief weekly. And the reason I say that is because one of these days when war comes as a surprise, it's not going to coincide with my annual speech in December. Whereas I put out warnings about China, Russia, and there's one in today's World Affairs Brief about uh, how you know, the globalists will react to a China attack on Taiwan and how China intends to blanket the U.S. with conflict in both Russia, Taiwan, and Iran at the same time in order to keep them from prosecuting a war against China. You need that kind of information to know when the threat is coming. And um, so I'm just warning you, I don't put this brief out for my own health. It's here to save you someday so that you'll have advance warning. And I hope you'll take that in the spirit in which I say it. It's a pleasure to be with you, and <clears throat> I'm going to give a private briefing after I close when we turn off all the cameras, and so we'll talk about something very private and very important that will pertain to most of you and some of your concerns. So I thank you very much for hearing me in this major presentation.